Good morning. Good morning. This Sunday, we celebrate Advent by remembering who Jesus Christ is. We light the second candle to remind us that Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus came to earth over 2,000 years ago as the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1 1, 1. one night, about 30 years after his birth, Jesus told us why God the Father sent him to earth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16. And in 1 Peter 1, verse 23, we are taught that Christians have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Also, the book of James, in chapter 1, verse 21, we are told to lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Jesus Christ, the very word of God, came to earth over 2,000 years ago. He was God's gift to mankind to save us from our sins. Let us not forget that Jesus, the word of God, will return someday possibly soon. This we are taught in Acts 1, verse 11, when angels told the apostles, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. If God kept his first promise to send Jesus to earth as a baby, he will most certainly keep his second promise to send Jesus Christ back to earth as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Thank you, Adam. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's so great to see everybody here and uh, that you made it after shoveling out and plowing through everything. Um, it's so good to have everybody watching online as well. We want to welcome all you that are watching online. Hopefully there's nobody in Florida sitting on the beach sipping some lemonade, and so I'd be kind of bitter about that this morning. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, no, we, everybody is welcome, whether you're on the beach or in Arizona or wherever you are in Chicago. We know we have uh, special friends there and family, so we just welcome everybody, and also those who aren't able to come because they're not feeling well, we just pray that the Lord would bless you and, and heal you, and we'll be praying for you shortly here. Would you please stand this morning? We're going to open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you so much for all you've done for us, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful Sunday school we had this morning. And, and Dave and Chris and sharing about their ministry in Cambodia and, and so many of the other people that are ministering, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we can be a part of this, Lord, that we can be encouraging them, but they've encouraged us in a great way this morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit moving through them in a powerful way, and we thank you for Dave being able to come and, and preach this morning and, and speak about what's going on, and, and we thank you, Lord, for how you've used Dave and Chris as a powerful couple, couple there in Cambodia, and for, as Dave expressed, uh, the people that have gone on before them that laid the groundwork we thank you, Lord, for all that. We praise you, Lord, that you're in control. And it helps us realize that as sometimes we feel like we're being squeezed here in this country, we thank you, Lord, that there is a great hope, Lord, and that you're going to have all the enemies under your feet in the end. And we may have to go through some uh, hard times, Lord, but you will be with us. And we thank you, Lord. And we ask for your presence in a powerful way, Lord. And as we worship you this morning, we pray that you'll be here in a powerful way, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, would touch each person. We pray for those online that are hurting, Lord God, that are, that are ill, Lord. We pray for healing for them, Lord. We pray for strength. We pray for encouragement, Lord. We pray for hope, that they would have hope, Lord. 
We thank you for the hope that we have in you, Lord, that great, precious hope. We thank you, Lord, that we have something to look forward to that's beyond what we could ever imagine or think, as it says in your word in Corinthians. We thank you, Lord, for each person here and for the other visitors that are here this morning, that you'd bless them in a special way. And any of the unspoken requests, Lord, that people that are hurting physically, emotionally, and spiritually, Lord, that you'd bless them now as we worship you. We thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity to worship you in spirit and truth and in freedom. Thank you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing unto the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. O ancient of days. The word of God the Father from before the world began, every star and every planet. Has been fashioned by your hand. All creation holds together by the power of your voice. Let the skies declare your glory. Let the land and sea rejoice. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of every man. And your cry of love rings out across the land. Yet you left the days of angels, came to seek and save the lost, and exchanged the joy of heaven for the anguish of the cross. With the prayer you fed the hungry, with the word you still proceed, and how silently you suffer that the guilty may go free. You're the author of creation, you're the Lord of every man, and your cry and love rings out across the land. With a shout you rose victorious, resting victory from the grave, 
and ascended into heaven, leading captives in your way. Now you stand before the Father, interceding for your own, from each tribe and tongue and nation, in worthy sinners' home. You're the author of creation, you're the Lord of every man, and your cry of love brings up the cross and land. You're the author of creation, you're the Lord of every man, and your cry of love brings up the cross and land. church family. Welcome to church uh, this morning. Thanks for braving the elements and uh, making your way here. Grateful for those who are joining online, uh, wherever you're joining us from, either live this morning or sometime during the, the course of the week. We're grateful that you're here. This is a, a special Sunday, um, and it's always special when we can have uh, missionary guests with us. We are the Christian and Missionary Alliance. That's who we are. And missionary is our middle name, and uh, it's who we are. And we are an alliance of uh, our home churches here in the state. In the states, uh, along with missionaries, 700 strong that we send as part of the alliance family uh, to take the gospel to unreached people all over the world. And that's the alliance and partnership that we share and uh, this morning, it, we have the privilege of just having a real-life, tangible example and expression of that partnership with Dave and Chris Manfred, who are joining us here uh, from uh, their missionaries to Cambodia and their home 
uh, for a year on, uh, on home assignment. I would point your attention, uh, we, we do support our missionaries out of what's called the Great Commission Fund. It's a large fund managed by uh, the alliance that we give to that supports uh, all, of our, uh, all of our missionaries. And so we as a church uh, over the years have committed 10% of our general income uh, goes directly to missions. But we also want people to feel and know that they have a sense of partnership in that. And we want you to be able to give uh, on your own as the Lord leads. There's a faith a promise card that is in your bulletin. That's for something you to take and pray over and uh, make a commitment. There's a, a way you can uh, indicate your commitment there and, and, and bring it to the church. Or if it's something you just want to uh, keep as your own private faith commitment to giving to the Lord's work all over the world, you're welcome to do that. I encourage you to, to look through that and pray about how you can be, uh, how you can be involved. Uh, so they have been with us uh, since Wednesday. They were here Wednesday night with the Bible Adventure Club students and our TCA youth group. That was a great time together. And then they were here yesterday uh, for brunch. We had a special brunch, and I just want to say thank you to Eileen and the team of ladies who were here early yesterday. I've heard so many good comments about that was like the best brunch I've ever had in my life. And uh, we just thank you, uh, ladies and our hospitality team, for, for doing that. Um, and then it was our great privilege to hear from Dave and Chris about what the Lord is doing in the land of Cambodia yesterday. So we finished our missions conference this morning. Uh, they were here over the Sunday school hour, and it was a wonderful time. And then we'll be hearing from Dave uh, here in a few uh, in a few moments. And then after the service this morning, uh, we have a, a, a lunch downstairs. Thanks for everybody bringing in food for that. Even if you didn't, you're welcome, welcome, welcome to stay and uh, join us for that. And it's just a wonderful time together right after the service. So then from the festive to the mundane, uh, next Sunday, a church budget meeting. And uh, it's actually kind of important and really important, especially for members of the church to come and be part of that as we set, uh, set priorities and, and look ahead uh, to the year to come. And then basically we'll, we'll vote at the end to approve the budget for 2022. Bible Adventure Club Christmas program, Wednesday the 15th. Uh, Megan and her team of volunteers have been working hard with our kids in uh, putting that together. And so that's for the church to come to and invite others. Uh, we want the community to come and uh, support these kids and their families who will be here. And that's the 15th. We'll have a 5.30 p.m. meal downstairs. And then the program will be at 6 p.m p.m. up here in the sanctuary on Wednesday the 15th. Live nativity on December the 19th, and as you pulled into the front lot, you might have seen some of the uh, elements of the stable that are going to be put together, and we partner with Pastor uh, David Hibison, who's uh, also who's been our interim youth director over these months, and uh, the church that he pastors, Change of Heart uh, Church. And we've partnered together over the last few years, and we're going to do that again. And I have a live nativity that will go from 5 to 7 p.m. on the 19th. That's a Sunday night with a live program at 5.30 p.m. over here in the upper parking lot. And then uh, there will be gingerbread houses and refreshments and those sort of things uh, downstairs as well. So that's a great thing to come to. It's a great thing to invite the community to as well. Christmas Eve service on uh, December the 24th, uh, candlelight service at 5 p.m., wonderful, uh, wonderful time together as we, we celebrate the arrival, uh, the first advent of our Lord Jesus. And in so doing, we look forward and look ahead to his second advent, his second coming. Uh, so that's a lot. There's great stuff happening in December. It's a great time to be part of the church. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and children's church today. Uh, kids, if you want to go, you can go with Megan. There's some in the back in the lobby as well. And we pray God's blessing upon your time together. It's awesome. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. All right. 
Let's join together in prayer. Our Father, uh, we do worship you this morning, Almighty God, because there is none like you. We worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what we want to do. We're not here under any sense of compulsion or guilt or force, but we freely come today to freely worship because of this gift of salvation, this gift of eternal life that you have freely given to us. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to worship together here in person and online. Thank you for uh, giving us uh, a truth to embrace and giving us a message to proclaim. Thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ who left the glories of heaven to come to a sin-sick world that he created that we might be redeemed. Born in the most humble, humble of ways. Walking the dusty roads uh, among people that didn't uh, appreciate or accept or always understand. But he came in a deep, uh, deep love for a lost world that needs to be reconciled with God. We thank you that you are the ancient of days and that your glory can reign over all the earth, that you are the one who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, the alpha, the omega, the beginning, and the end. And what a wonderful practical meaning that has for our life, knowing that wherever we are right now, whatever we're experiencing, whatever our struggle that you who sees from the end, from the beginning, not just from the beginning up until now, but you know our past. You've redeemed that. You know our present and are currently working in our lives and you know our future and you are sovereign and you have a plan and all that we're experiencing today is a part of that and you're weaving it all together for your glory and for our good. Help us, Lord, to take this gospel message, this life-changing message to the whole world, whether that's across the street or whether that's in Southeast Asia. Lord, the message is the same and the message is true. And it is a message of hope and peace and joy and forgiveness. Things that this world desperately craves we try and find it, try and try and try and find it in so many other places, but there is really nowhere else to turn but to you. And so, Lord, give us courage, give us boldness, give us insight, give us divine appointments, give us open doors, and then, and then the courage and the willingness to walk through those doors knowing that that which you have called us to do, you will also equip us to do. Help us to love our neighbor. Because first we have loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You indeed are the author of creation Desire to be the Lord of every man. So help us to take this message across the land. Father, for the needs that need to be met, we have our personal needs. Our church has needs for the ministry to go on here. But beyond that, we have... A, a, a need and a privilege to support our missionary friends around the world. And Lord, I just want to thank you. I do this privately and I'll just do it publicly. I thank you for the generosity of your people. 
It's amazing how this church has been not only sustained, but, but thriving and above and beyond. You have supplied, and through these months of, of challenge, you have been faithful. And your faithfulness has been evident through the faithfulness of your people. And so, Lord, we're thankful. We're a thankful people today. Thank you again for uh, just the opportunity to be together. I pray, Lord, for your anointing upon your servant as he comes in just a few moments, that you would speak to us through him in a way that we cannot ignore, in a way that we can't just pass off and say, well, that was another good Sunday but in a way that would move us beyond comfort, beyond safety, and move us to a point that's beyond where we are right now in terms of our desire, our willingness, our, our uh, practical application of how we live the Christian life. We honor you, Lord. We thank you. We praise your name, and it's in Jesus I pray. Amen. <laughs>
17 million people, 44 different ethnic groups in the land of Cambodia. And uh, our, this is our family. We were really privileged with this summer. We had everyone together. That's kind of a rare occasion. We have four kids, two daughter-in-laws, one son-in-law, and one young man in the back who's pretty interested in our daughter. He made the family picture. Uh, and, uh, and then we have three grandkids as well. So it was really a joy for us to connect together. And you might remember, I mean, it's been so much fun to be here, just to hear the talent, the giftedness you have in this church both in music and in worship and in art. And some of you might remember that four years ago, my mom, at 100 years old, played in the worship service. And by God's grace, she's still around, uh, 104 years old now, still playing the piano. It's a little rough for her to get out traveling far distances these days. But, uh, you know, it's just quite remarkable. She's actually survived her second pandemic because she was around in 1918 as a one-year-old. And now they're round two, and she's made it through both of them. So God has been so gracious. And uh, uh, I know she would have loved to have been here, but as I said, it's, she's still doing out quite well, quite well. So we're thankful for that. And um, this, uh, this year, the theme for Alliance Missions in the U.S. is all of Jesus for all the world. And specifically, we want to look at that kind of topic in the context of the land of Cambodia. And uh, the history of the Alliance work in Cambodia started in 1923. In fact, the Alliance was the pioneer mission agency to bring the gospel to Cambodia, the first one and the only one for about the first almost 50 years. All the evangelical group working in Cambodia, faithful missionaries who served, gave their lives. They translated the Bible into the Cambodian language and, uh, and saw the, the initial work going forward there. But after almost 50 years of missionary effort, by the year 1970, the Cambodian church was only about 1,000 believers. And Cambodia had the reputation of being one of the most resistant countries to the gospel, actually, in the Alliance world. And, uh, but then in the 1970s, as the Vietnam War began to spill over and there was a lot of unrest, uncertainty in the country, that actually created openness for the gospel. And there began this gospel response that led to the church growing from 1,000 to 10,000 by 1975. So there's this sense that finally the harvest has come to Cambodia. But then by 1979, the church was down to 2,000. What happened? Well, what happened for those of you that maybe are history buffs is that there was an organization called the Khmer Rouge that came to power in 1975. They were responsible for what became known as the killing fields where in a little over three and a half years, about 1.7 million Cambodians died. That's one out of five Cambodians died in that short period of time. And they particularly targeted the educated, so they killed off almost all the doctors, almost all the teachers during that period of time. I know it's just incredibly stupid, but horrific. And we're still actually recovering. Here we are 40 years down the road, and we're still recovering from having that, uh, the, the teachers and the doctors being wiped out from that period. Of the Christian church, of the 33 Alliance pastors that were alive in 75, there were only six who survived. The Khmer Rouge, 80% of our Alliance pastors died uh, giving their lives for Christ. Of the 10,000 believers you already saw, also about 80% of the believers died during the Pol Pot or the Khmer Rouge regime. And so the church, it was a really a sense of, God, what in the world's going on here? Uh, we finally thought the harvest had come, but then the harvest was wiped out. And uh, I guess one of the, the things that a couple of quotes come to mind in looking back at this through the lens of history is Tertullian's words about the ancient church, where he said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And Jesus' words that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the Cambodian church has actually been a testimony to Jesus' uh, Jesus' message. Cambodians were kicked, uh, the Khmer Rouge were kicked out of power by the Vietnamese communists. They allowed Cambodians to flee the country and many went into refugee camps, primarily in Thailand. While they were there, we had actually some of our missionaries that were also working in those refugee camps. 
uh, that were not only uh, bringing practical help, but also sharing the, the hope for people who had been hopeless and had been almost wiped out. And, and they also did medical work in those refugee camps. And as a result of all those things, not just the Alliance, but other Christian agencies as well, there were churches that were established, reestablished in those refugee camps. And as a result of that ministry, the camps were open all the way until 1993. In 1993, the camps were closed. The Cambodians came back into Cambodia under a new constitution that gave freedom of religion. And the church grew from 2,000 to 20,000 believers from the end of the Khmer Rouge. So the Lord replaced the harvest and doubled it of what had been lost by 1995. Now to continue the story, we have to change the scale by a factor of 10. So 20,000 believers in 95, that's the same number, but on the, the left axis, the, the factor is by 10, because to the glory of God up to 2020, the church has grown to about 300,000 believers. So it's truly been an amazing season of harvest in Cambodia. Actually, if you look on the back church, they have the Alliance Life magazine. The lead article is a story about uh, Cambodia and the growth of the church, particularly even since COVID has first hit. So it's been uh, our privilege to be in Cambodia. Christianity Today, a number of years ago, talked about in their lead article also how Cambodians ushered a miraculous movement for Christianity. It was illegal to be a Christian in Cambodia as recent as 1991. And since that time, how the Lord has, as they say, there's been a church planting boom. Uh, Chris and I sometimes say we kind of feel like we have been living in the book of Acts. And it really has been a privilege for us. And, and I will say again that we stand on broad shoulders of the missionaries that served for decades, never saw the harvest, but faithfully sowed uh, to bring the gospel to Cambodians. We stand on the broad shoulders of Cambodian martyrs who gave their life for Christ. And, and truly the harvest we see now is God answering prayers of his saints through the generations to see the gospel come to Cambodia. 300,000, that's really encouraging. It's still a little less than one out of 50 Cambodians who knows Christ in a country of 17 million. So there's still much work that needs to be done. But getting back to our theme, all of Jesus for all the world, what I'd like to do is actually look at um, all of Jesus in the context of what in the Alliance we call the fourfold gospel. You have the logo in your church. Uh, there you see it as well. And that just is kind of a reminder. And then also telling some stories from Cambodia that connect with each of those. And the, the fourfold gospel <laughs> starts with the cross, is center, is first, foremost. And it's a reminder in the alliance we talk about a fourfold gospel. Christ is our Savior, is that foundation of all that we teach and preach. And uh, you've already uh, seen from Acts 4.12, if you're in the Sunday school hour, Jesus, uh, we, we are reminded that salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And it's the name of Jesus is the only, the only, the only name by which we can be saved. That is politically incorrect and biblically true. Amen. There is only one way for a right relationship with God, and that is through Jesus. Uh, for myself, I became a Christian when I was 19 years old. I was a student at the University of Minnesota. I'd been raised in the church, knew about Jesus, but never knew Jesus in a personal way. Went on a retreat trying to meet some cute girls, and instead I met Jesus and uh, through Campus Crusade. And and I remember going out alone in the woods to pray. And after being convicted in my heart, just kneeling down an October afternoon in Wisconsin and saying, Lord, I know I have made my mistakes in my life, but I believe Jesus. He died on the cross and rose from the grave to forgive me of my sins and to give me eternal life. I trust in you, Lord, to forgive me. Just a simple sinner's prayer said by a young man alone in the woods. And that changed everything. And that changed everything. And I won't assume it. I mean, I probably have a sense, but I won't assume it. Have you made that decision? Have you come to that place in your life, your spiritual life, where you would kneel down in your heart and say, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior? Uh, because that's the door that opens eternity. 
And if you've not made that decision, I invite you. You can do it here today. You can do it at your home. But if you do, talk to your pastor, talk to an elder, talk to a Christian friend. You've made that decision to ask Christ to be your Savior. Uh, those of you who were here yesterday, you heard about Chris's work with helping us to build buildings, including this, uh, this urban ministry training center building, a Bible school for urban ministry. Four years ago, I asked you to pray about that. And by God's grace, that building is completed and there, the Bible school is open. And, uh, but Chris, even before that, for about 10 years, has been working with this man. His name is Brassal. He's kind of been her right-hand man in these construction projects. And he is not a believer, but Chris is quite bold in sharing Christ. And, you know, over many, many years, she would talk to him about Christ. And he was not, you know, he was polite, but not really that interested until three years ago. And Brassal made that the same decision to ask Christ to become his savior. And, uh, and so to see the light bulbs turn on in this life that have been invested in for many years, and the light bulbs really turned on. Uh, he really, his life began to change in quite radical ways. And it actually brings us to the second point in the, uh, our fourfold gospel, and that is Christ our sanctifier. Now that's kind of a, uh, an old word. What does it mean? Well, one of the texts that gives us some insight is from 1 Thessalonians. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you comple uh, completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. We have this idea that sanctify has this idea of being holy, being blameless, of not just in our uh, having that position of being right and holy and blameless, but actually in our experience growing and being more and more like Jesus and growing in what that means. And, and so uh, one of the, the ways that has been helpful for me to understand this, the way I explain sanctification to our Bible college students is that first you make a decision to ask Jesus to be your Savior. But then there's a second decision that needs to be made. And the second decision is that asking Jesus to be your Lord. That happens typically for most of us after we've been saved. When we say, Lord, I've been driving the wheel of my life. I've been driving the wheel of my car all my life. I've been the one in charge, but now, Jesus, I want you to drive my car. I want you to be the Lord of my life. And you make that decision. Uh, then, uh, And it's not just a one-time decision. Romans 12, 1 reminds us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. And, and the problem with the living sacrifice always tries to crawl off the altar. We need to keep putting ourselves under the Lordship of Christ, a daily dedication. Jesus, you are my Lord today. And there is this process. And, and the thing that happens is when that happens in our lives, God begins to change us from the inside. It's not us grunting it out, trying to, oh, I've got to get to be a better person. But God, by his Holy Spirit, begins to do fresh work in our lives. So we become more and more like Jesus. And it's not just a straight trajectory. I mean, it's up and down, it's up and down. But as we continue to grow under the lordship of Jesus in our lives, he is the one who does the changing. As it says at the end of the text there, he who calls his faithful, he will do it. It's not us grunting it out. It's God, by his Spirit, transforming us as we yield to the lordship of Christ. Our friend Brassal, after he had come, made his commitment of faith in Christ, he, uh, one of his first, uh, he, he wanted to be baptized. That was the work of God by his spirit. He knew he wanted to identify as a follower of Christ. That's a sanctifying work as you want to obey. It's not because of grunting it out, but because God changes your heart. Uh, he and I began to meet weekly, Tuesday, 6.30 in the morning, to study God's word. And he became a, a real student of the word and began to grow in understanding. And it was really interesting how God by his spirit gave him the gift of evangelism. And he began to just boldly share uh, his new faith with his friends and his neighbors and was completely unashamed of the gospel even when he was persecuted because of it. And, and uh, this young man, uh, he was uh, the young man next to Brassal there is uh, a young man who had a troubled past. He had been in jail. He had addiction issues. He probably has some mental health issues as well. And after he'd come out of jail, the family didn't know what to do with him. And so they literally locked him in a room for two years. 
And, uh, and Brassel heard about this. This is not a relative, but he just heard about this. And he said, well, he said to the family, can I take him in my house? And so he took him into his house and he taught him the construction trade and, and he began to invest in this man's life that everyone had given up on. Well, that's not something a normal person would do unless they have Jesus as Lord and love their neighbors as themselves. And God puts a fresh love for people that only God can give. And, and this young man's life was transformed because of the ways Brasau invested in him. There was this uh, old widow and when COVID hit hard in Cambodia earlier this year, uh, they, they had government lockdowns where they didn't allow people even to leave their house to get food. There was this widow, this is her home. And Brassau didn't have a lot, but what he had, he shared what he had with this widow. Again, not looking out for his own interests, but for the interests of others. Again, the work of sanctification as it's lived out in a believer's life with Jesus as Lord. And... And they always think if you want to figure out how a person is doing in their sanctification, the person you can ask that knows the best is their spouse. And uh, this is Brasau's wife. And uh, she is not yet a believer. We're praying that she will come to Christ. Uh, she's afraid of what her family will say if she becomes a Christian. But what she has said to Chris and I on several occasions has been, since my husband has become a Christian, I can't believe the beautiful changes I've seen in his life. He even helps me with the dishes. <laughs> That's a sanctifying work of God in a, in a person's life. And brothers and sisters, I ask you the question, have you made the decision as Christ the Savior? Let me also ask you afresh, have you made this, the decision to have Jesus as your sanctified? And that happens through a fresh yielding to Jesus as Lord. That I'm no longer the boss Jesus, I want you to be my boss and to lead and direct me. Christ our healer is the third part. Chris and I did not grow up in the Alliance, but we're very thankful for the Alliance. And this was one of the things that stood out to us as we were first getting introduced to the Alliance, uh, is that Christ is healer, you know, what, what's the relevance of that? Well, for us, it was relevance that we believe in the Alliance, that Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. Yes, we are thankful for advances in medical science and those, the things that we get through doctors. We have doctors and nurses on our team as well, but it's also realizing that Jesus is still able to work in powerful ways that are beyond, over and beyond, beyond what, we, what we ask or imagine. And, uh, James 5 is the invitation. If people are sick, call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. Uh, coming in faith and asking God. We, Chris and I have experienced the Lord's healing both through medicine and through powerful God, things outside of the medical realm. Uh, we've both had those experiences ourselves personally and seen it in the lives of others as well. But I'd like to tell you a story about a place called Alon Beng. Anlong Bang is in northern Cambodia, and it's actually an infamous place in Cambodia because Anlong Bang is the place, is the final holdout of Pol Pot. Well, who was Pol Pot? He was the leader of this Khmer Rouge group that was responsible for 1.7 million deaths. And Anlong Bang was where he was his final holdout. He, uh, Pol Pot could be called the Hitler of Southeast Asia. And that is actually the place where he died uh, in 1998. And there you see kind of what's the, the, the site where his bones uh, and his ashes, he cremated ashes, were, were kept. If there's ever a place on the planet that you could call the heart of darkness, it would be An Long Vang. In fact, uh, uh, Cambodians to this day are quite worried because most of the people that live in An Long Vang used to be Khmer Rouge. And they received an amnesty from the government, but these were still the hardcore of the hardcore Khmer Rouge. So now the people who live there are the, either very elderly Khmer Rouge or their children or grandchildren who mostly live in An Long Vang. And uh, we have a missionary couple, Suet and Sina Lao. They are Cambodian Americans. They were refugees and came uh, to Christ, came to the U.S. Sina is a nurse by training. She went to Nyack uh, University 
Her husband, also trained as a pastor at Nyack University, returned to Cambodia 25 years ago. And they've been one of our most effective missionary couples at starting churches in places where they've never been before. They used to be in Poi Pet, but now in Poi Pet, there are already churches there that have Cambodian leaders, so you don't need missionaries. So in 2016, they left Poi Pet. They came back to the U.S. for a one-year home assignment. We thought we're after that home assignment, we'd send them to another unreached area of Cambodia in the West. But while they were in the U.S. from 2016 to 2017, I began hearing reports that God was doing some fresh work in and around An Long Vang. And our Cambodian church leader said, would, you, would the mission consider sending them as missionaries to An Long Vang? And so while Silton Sinao were in the U.S. in early 2017, I called them up and said, hey, are you sitting down? Would you be at all open to going to An Long Vang? And uh, my role as field director, that's one of the areas of responsibility I have is deciding where missionaries serve. And, but I didn't want to send them without really having them to pray about it. And so they said to me, we need to, we need to pray about this. Because they knew exactly what was being asked to, to serve in the heart of darkness. And uh, three days later, I called them back and they said, yeah, we are willing to go. And so in faith, they prepared to go. And, and little did we know that right about the same time that was happening, something else was happening that was actually quite significant. And uh, there's about an hour south of An Long Vang, there's this little town called Sre Noi. And that's our closest Alliance church. This is the pastor, his name is Pastor D. That's the church behind him there. And uh, this is our closest church to An Long Vang at the time. And, and uh, around that time, Pastor D was serving in his church and he gave a gospel invitation. There was a woman that trusted in Christ. And she lived, you know, Sereno is here, Alan Wang is here. She lived kind of halfway between. And so this woman came to Christ. And uh, she told her husband she'd become a Christian. He was kind of a kind of a drunk in town, kind of a had a reputation of being an evil man. But he was intrigued and he went with her to church a few times. Never made a commitment to Christ, but uh, he, he did go to the church a few times. And her husband's job, his name is Mr. Kong. Mr. Kong's job was he made charcoal. And the way to make charcoal is you take wood and you put it in this big kind of brick kiln. It's a brick and earthen kiln. It has many tons of brick and earth over it. And Mr. Kong and his seven-year-old son were taking the charcoal out of the, the, this brick kiln. And while they were in there, it collapsed on top of them. And uh, there was this, uh, the, 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 uh, the wife saw this, the Christian, she said, Jesus, save them. So she ran over there and some of the neighbors ran over there. They began taking off these many uh, hundreds of pounds of brick and earth. And this has happened occasionally in Cambodia. Almost never anyone survives after this. Uh, they got to the seven-year-old son who was also in there, and he came out almost unscathed. But then they got to Mr. Kong, the husband. And when uh, he was coughing out blood, he had blood coming out of, his, out of his ears and his nose. There was internal bleeding. And uh, the worst part, as they took him out, was his right eye had been popped out of its socket and was hanging on the cheek by the optic nerve as a result of this accident. And... And so uh, he was conscious, and they put him on the back of a motorcycle, and they went to the local clinic, and the medical care in this area is almost non-existent. And the clinic saw Mr. Kong, and said, we don't know what to do, take him to another clinic. So they brought him to another clinic, and they said the same thing, bring him to another clinic. They went to four clinics, and nobody could help him. And then Mr. Kong said to his wife, bring me to that church. Whether I live or die, I want to go to that church. And so his wife drove him to church, and Pastor D saw Mr. Kong, and the first thing he said to him is, oh, go to the clinic. <laughs> and Mr. Kong said, no. Whether I live or die, I want to be here. And Pastor D told me how he put his hands, they were trembling, and it wasn't just him. There were other people that were there as he did this. He put their hand on trembling on both shoulders of Mr. Cog, and they began to pray. And uh, over the course of about a 10-minute prayer, uh, 
the bleeding Mr. Kong told me had been, the, the coagulated blood that he was coughing up had been the size of his thumb. After a few minutes, it was only the size of half of his thumb. And, and then after a few more minutes, the blood was just like the tip of his pinky finger. And then by 10 minutes, the, the, the bleeding, that the blood that he coughed up completely stopped. And what was even more remarkable is that in that 10 minute time, the eye that had been hanging on the cheek went all back into its socket all by itself without anyone touching it. And Mr. Kong was able to see, he wasn't able to see when the eye was out, immediately when it went back in, he was able to see just fine. And Mr. Kong raised his hand and said, I'm healed. And that was the day he also trusted in Jesus as a savior. Well, this is Mr. Kong and their seven-year-old boy and his wife. And as Mr. Kong came back to his community, I mean, these people had seen him with the eyeball hanging on the cheek, right? And they saw him and said, what happened to him? And he went back to the clinics and they said, who did this to you? And Mr. Kong began to tell him, Jesus healed me. And this, as a result of that, there were people in, the, in his community that said, well, we want to trust in Jesus too. And so they began, uh, to, and it was kind of like they said, we believe in Jesus, what does that mean? And it was right at that time that our missionary couple, Sinala, arrived in that area. And they were able to work with Pastor D and the church and starting discipleship classes for those new believers. People had come to Christ. And, uh, and, and Mr. Kong has like eight siblings that live in villages and communities in and around the Anglong Bang area. And Mr. Kong began to go to his siblings and tell them how Jesus had healed them. And as a result of that, uh, as a result of that testimony, uh, many of those people started to, to believe in those communities as well and hearing through this testimony. And then uh, the, the discipleship began in those places as well uh, as these different you know, communities of light began to pop up in and around on Long Bay. And then it wasn't just Mr. Kong that was sharing the story, but it was the people in these communities that also began sharing the story of how Jesus had transformed their lives. And then the baptisms began as people began to identify as followers of Christ and say, yes, we want to follow Jesus. We want him to be the Lord of our lives. We want to grow in what it means to, to serve and follow him. And so as these people were coming to Christ, this place that was the heart of darkness was all of a sudden becoming a place where all these points of light of followers of Christ. And if you'd be at all interested on the CMA website, there was a video that was made of Mr. Kong's story in 2019. Uh, go to the CMA website, look up Out of the Ashes, which is a video story of Mr. Kong. It's quite well done. It was made in 2019, which is before COVID. And it announced that at that time, they've seen 130 people trust in Christ and 12 house churches planted. Uh, since that time, then COVID hit. And what has happened since COVID has hit? Well, the 12 churches has now become 23 churches. And about 1,200 people have come to Christ as a result of this movement of the Holy Spirit in and around on Long Bay, the place that was the heart of darkness. And you know, we've seen this from time to time where the places that are the darkest are the places where the light shines the brightest. And it's oftentimes in those places we've seen the Lord work in signs and wonders in ways that are beyond our normal to bring the gospel and to give credibility not only to the message, but the messenger of the power of the gospel to change and transform lives. Christ our Savior, Christ our Sanctuary, Christ our Healing, Christ our Coming King. Uh, we read, actually read this uh, this morning in worship, Acts 111. The angels word to the apostles, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him going to heaven. It's not going to be a surprise. Uh, I mean, it's not going to be without notice when Jesus returns. It's going to be obvious. We don't know the day or the hour. But there's an interesting dynamic as we look at the logo. We have the crown, Christ our coming king. But we also have another part of the logo, which is kind of the unfinished world. And that's a, a globe, but it's, it's not the full globe. I'm showing that the work of the gospel is not completed and bringing the gospel to the people and places of the world. And Jesus actually ties those two together 
in Matthew 24, 14, his return and the unfinished work of the gospel, when Jesus says, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And we don't know the day or the hour, but Jesus himself made a condition on his return. He said, this, we have to complete the Great Commission. That's what he says. It will be proclaimed in the whole world, a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And as we talked about in the Sunday school hour, that word nations doesn't mean countries. It means to all the ethnic groups on the planet that we need to finish this task to open the door of when the Lord returns. Now, there might be some question about what that exactly means in terms of uh, nations or ethnic groups, but those that study such things estimate there are about 4,000 ethnic groups, 4,000 people groups that do not have access to the gospel yet. These are the unreached places of the world. And of those, uh, those are kind of in the red areas on this map here. As I shared in the Sunday school hour, currently in those parts of the world where they have least access to the gospel, uh, we have about uh, only 10% of international missionaries serving in those areas. But in the Alliance, in the Alliance, it's about 80% of our workers are invested in those hard places. And so I just want to share that for your information that as you pray for Alliance missions, we are investing in going to those hard places. And your investment is truly to bring the gospel to the peoples and places that have the least opportunity to hear. Uh, this is our Alliance missions team that I'm privileged to, 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 to lead. And, and, uh, and as we're doing that work in Cambodia, we work in partnership with the Alliance churches in Cambodia. It's called the Khmer Evangelical Church. These are the 11 ethnic groups that we're directly involved in ministry the yellow ones are unreached people groups. And whether it's in Bible translation work or pioneer church planting, this is, these are the ethnic groups that, are, that the Alliance is focusing on in Cambodia. And, and I'd like to, uh, to, to bring your attention to a place called Stung Treng. Stung Treng is a provincial capital on the Mekong River in northern Cambodia. You can see it there. And uh, in Stung Treng, they have a teacher's, a regional teacher's college. In addition to that, they have a regional nursing college. And that's significant because it means that um, there aren't like a lot of options for Cambodians. If you want to be a teacher and you live in a certain region, you have to study in Stung Treng. If you want to be a nurse in this certain region of Cambodia, the only place to study is Stung Treng. And that region is eastern Cambodia near the border of Vietnam. So anyone who wants to be a student, uh, who wants to be a teacher or a nurse, if they want to study, they have to go to Stung Treng to study. Well, why is that significant? It's significant because this is a map of the different ethnic groups in Cambodia. Different colors are a different ethnic group, different language, different culture. And where do you see most of those ethnic groups are located? They're located exactly in eastern Cambodia where those anyone who wants to be a teacher or a nurse has to study in Stung Treng to get their degree. And so what that meant is that in 2015, we assigned one of our missionaries, Joyce Johns. She has her master's in public health. She's been a nurse for 40 years, 40 plus years. Uh, she's been working with Cambodians for 30 years. She always goes to the pioneer hard places. 2015, we assigned her to uh, part-time teach at that nursing college because we understood that from all these different unreached people groups in Eastern Cambodia, all the, uh, all, the, all the nurses would need to study at that school. So she had opportunity to get to know them, invest in their lives, share the gospel, disciple them. And since she's been assigned there, we've added more uh, missionaries to work in the team. We have some that are teaching English there. We have a, a family that's working with the ethnic Lao people that live in that area. And you even have a teacher that's helping to teach the, the missionary kids in that area. And so this is the team that has, uh, has grown in this place called Stung Treng because of its strategic importance for the kingdom. And in January of this year, uh, there is a Cambodian medical doctor who works with this nursing college with Joyce. He's a Cambodian. He's not a Christian. But he went down to Phnom Penh. When he was down at Phnom Penh, he was introduced to a Christian clinic 
that was in Phnom Penh. And you see the, the medical care in Stim Treg is actually really poor. And this Cambodian doctor, medical doctor, saw this Christian clinic. He, he was impressed by both the quality of the medical care, but more than that, the quality of the heart care that they gave to in showing love and compassion towards the patients. And he came back to Joyce, because he knew she was a Christian. He said, we need to have a Christian clinic in Stung Treng. It wasn't just a clinic, a Christian clinic in Stung Treng. And so Joyce began dialogue with the school director. And uh, as we talked about this and prayed about this as a mission, and, and the, the school director said, yeah, we'd be interested in that. And just even in the last month, there's been ongoing dialogue where not only the, the, the nursing school, but even the local hospital is asking us to get a Christian clinic going in this area. And so we had this open door. I began to have some dialogue with some folks that we knew in the US. Uh, the plan is that, Lord willing, January of 2023, we're going to have this get started, this Christian clinic, connected with the nursing school so the nursing students can have practical experience but being trained by Christian doctors and nurses in both good, uh, good uh, medical techniques, but also uh, with the heart care and the opportunities to share the gospel that would come uh, to these students. And we have the okay from Cambodian government authorities to do so. And they want to build it right on the grounds of the nursing college, this Christian clinic. It's about a $300,000 project for three years. And there's a church in Washington, D.C. has told us, we'll pay for the whole thing. So the funds are already there. But here's our request. We need two nurses and one medical doctor to invest from two years to 20 years in getting this off the ground in a way that will not only help the medical care in this medically underserved area, but will also be an opportunity to impact these unreached people groups as these nursing students come to study there with a specific request from the government, please teach Christian principles because we see that's what makes a difference. It's an amazing open door and I would ask you to really pray for us in this need and particularly that the harvest is plentiful, the labors are few, to pray for the Lord of the harvest to raise up the people that we need to augment the team in Stung Treng to get this Christian clinic started, Lord willing, January of 2023. How can we respond? Uh, well, if you know a doctor or nurse who was willing to go to Cambodia, that would be a great way. Uh, but if not, there are also other ways to respond. And I'm just going to make this pretty simple. I really see there are three options when it comes to Jesus' great commission, to be a sender. And uh, be a sender means to, to pray regularly for a missionary you know. And, and uh, some of you have uh, got our prayer card from four years ago. It, this new prayer card looks almost the same, but actually it's got some different prayer requests. So I invite you to take a new prayer card and just kind of as a reminder to, to pray for us. We also have a sign up. You know, if anybody would be interested, we have about a monthly email update that comes either from us personally or from our Cambodia field with needs that we have in terms of specific prayer requests. If you already got missionaries you're praying for, that's great. That's fine. But if you don't have, if you don't have a missionary you're regularly praying for, I encourage you to, to sign up. And I invite you to sign up for us and to pray for us and uh, the needs of the, the Lord's work in Cambodia. Again, supporting the Great Commission Fund. Uh, Pastor David has already talked about that is our bread and butter that keeps us on the field. Uh, you can either give generally to the Great Commission Fund if you want to designate it for what they, the Alliance is a missionary you love. That's allowed as well. Uh, but I just want to say, I know hearing from Pastor David, this church has been generous. I, I, I want to just be sure to say thank you for the fact that, you know, the stories we've shared from Cambodia, that's not just our stories, that's our stories as the Alliance family, you guys as being senders and praying and giving through the years, through the decades, some of you, that's a testimony to the partnership that we have to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth through being a sender. And then the other option is, uh, option number two, of course, is consider going. 
And if anybody's interested in, uh, uh, in that journey, uh, Chris, I'd love to talk with you. Uh, there is a website, calledtoserve.org. Uh, don't go to calledtoserve.com, that's the Mormons. Calledtoserve.org is the alliance. And what that is for is people that are kind of wondering, is this something? Might God be calling me to serve cross-culturally to bring the gospel? There are Today, there are like 40 openings around the world with the Alliance, waiting for somebody to say yes. Um, does that mean that you sign up on that website that, okay, next week you're going? No, but it'll start a journey of, of dialogue. Somebody will call you within a couple of weeks to begin that dialogue. And, you know, to be honest, we the places where we need, are sending missionaries, where we need missionaries, are typically not looking for quote-unquote missionaries. They're looking for people with practical skills who love Jesus. And it will take either their teaching or their, uh, you know, their, uh, their medical skills or their practical skills to get into these countries because they're closed countries to missionaries. That's where the Alliance is sending most of our workers. Cambodia is not closed. We're, we're still open uh, to missionaries of all types. But, but uh, most of the places where the Alliance is sending folks are to these closed access countries. And this would be my encouragement is that Ask the Lord. Are you calling me? Don't feel guilt if you don't feel a burden. I mean, God, but if there's something that stirs in your heart and this is something you kind of want to explore with the Lord, uh, don't just dismiss it. And the other thing I'd say for those of you that are parents or grandparents, if God stirs in the hearts of your kids or grandkids, please don't stand in the way of God's call. It might not be to a safe place, but the safest place is in the center of God's will. And so um, it really is. Uh, we've been missionaries for 26 years. We've seen a lot of crazy stuff in Cambodia, but what we've really seen is God has been faithful. God has been faithful to us and actually to our family as uh, we've invested our lives in that, in that place. And could it be that the Lord might be calling some here? Uh, to consider going to one of those places as well. Third option, be a sender, be a goer. Third option, disobey Jesus. Because this is his great commission, to go and make disciples of all nations. It's not our idea, this is Jesus' idea. If Jesus is your Savior and Jesus is your Lord, it means you really need to be connected in some way with his call to the nations. Don't choose box number three. But for box number one, box number two, what would the Lord by his Holy Spirit have you do? And as you reflect and pray about that and discern God's direction, may he give you his outward blessing as you serve him here and as you also invest to the ends of the earth. Thank you so much for the privilege of being together. Amen. Would you please stand? We're going to sing His Name is Wonderful. And, and what a marvelous time we've had today to just hear how the Manfreds have been ministering to people and many with them. And, and uh, I'm excited and encouraged by that because we also have a lot of witnessing to do here in this country too. And uh, But everybody needs the Lord. And so with this song, just worshiping the Lord, his name is wonderful. Let's give it all to him.
Grateful for your presence this morning, uh, Dave and Chris. Uh, thank you for your investment in, in us over these days. And um, I know they have a home in St. Paul that they don't get to stay in all the time, but they own it and they have it. And uh, so they've been commuting back and forth from St. Paul all week, and we're, we're just grateful for that, grateful for your presence. Uh, please stay for lunch. And uh, that'll be served downstairs. We'll let Dave and Chris uh, go first as our guests. And the work is not easy. Uh, the work that God has called us to do. But God does not call us to ease or to comfort or to safety. He calls us to faithfulness. And the question is, uh, will we be faithful? And so we'll be talking in the days and weeks to come about how we can respond uh, you individually, as families, and we corporately as a church, how can we respond to this fresh challenge that we've received uh, this morning and over these past few days? So uh, go in peace, and let me just say a word of prayer before you go. Father, thank you for meeting us here today. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the opportunities before us. Thank you for your great love that has changed our lives and can change others. Thank you for the food, for the meal that we're about to enjoy and all those who participated in that. I pray that you'd use it uh, to strengthen us that we might serve you all the more effectively today and in the days ahead. Father, we love you. We honor you. We bless you because you're worthy of these things. And we pray all of this in the wonderful name of Jesus our Savior, our Sanctifier, our Healer, and our coming King. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. <laughs>